Welcome, everybody. We have a guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Gloria Chance, um, Chief Psychologist and Chief Information Officer at Musa Group. She will be talking through, uh, to us and helping us deal, um, give us tips uh, on uh, how to um, combat stress and burnout kind of things. And we have been um, we have been discussing that on our Kernel Summit list. So um, she's here to help us. Gloria, you can take over. Hello, um, thank you so much and good morning or afternoon, everyone. I'm in sunny California and I'm sorry I'm not there with you today, but I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Um, so what I want to do is just, if you're not familiar with my work, I've been doing a lot of work in the mainframe industry with um, IBM Broadcom and some other groups, Rocket Software, et cetera. And my group, I was a former and I'm still a tech person, but I transitioned to become a psychologist and I work in transformation through imagination and the technology of the mind. And I think many of us don't realize, I'm assuming everyone in the audience is human, right? So I'm assuming that most of us though, we don't understand what it's like to be human unless it hurts. So stress and anxiety and those things, they get in the way of us being productive. And it's becoming since COVID more and more of an issue. So what we do is we disrupt thinking. We do a lot of things around shifting the way people think, activating the way that they should think differently. Because as human beings, our minds are just like, um, like tech. Our mind is the operating system to our body. So whatever we put in our mind, whatever we put in our brains, whatever patterns we create, whatever stories we create, they actually go into our system from communication from the brain and they, they create our lives, our experiences and our health. And so today we're gonna to talk about psychological safety, how you create it, why it's important, how you support team members, because again, as human beings, we, are, we don't live on this planet alone. We need each other. We need to have skill sets so that we can help each other be sort of the best version that we can in the moment. So we wanna talk about that. How do you support yourself and how do you deal specifically with stress, anxiety, and resiliency? And so that's what we're gonna to cover today. Now, why do we wanna talk about psychological safety? Again, the brain is the operating system for the body. And when we interact with each other and with ourselves, it can either be positive or negative. And we have around 10,000 or more thoughts per day. And think about if you were a computer processing that, that's a lot of information. And unfortunately, somewhere between 90 and 95% of those thoughts are the same and they are negative. And so it's important for us to shift our thinking now into this positive behavior around how do we understand others and engage with others. So let's get into what psychological safety is. It's really about listening and learning. And the thing that I say a lot to very technical at people and, and leaders is that the new hard skills are the soft skills. The things we're going to be talking about today, they in the past, they were ignored. But for many of us, if we know what stress has done to us or others in our families, we get the importance of understanding these tips. So to be psychologically safe, you wanna learn how to listen and learn from other people. You also want to acknowledge hard work. So really psychological safety is about in your environment, you support each other. So if someone's having a bad day and you're not, you support them. If someone needs encouragement, you acknowledge the work that they're doing. You understand and empathize with your teammate, especially if they seem to be struggling. And then you also are trying to create working relationships that are based on positive acts. So in other words, with your clients, with your teammates, with your leaders, you really want to strive towards, you know what, let's not have any drama because there is enough going on. You also want to set a tone of belonging. So part of this, when we look at, you know, all of the different generations living and all the different types of people who are in our environment. It's really worth the effort to build psychological safety, which is around trust so that you can execute and support. Come in, do your job, go home. And if you wanna have drama at home, have it at home, but let's maybe not have it at work. And so one of the key things in um, psychological safety is empathy. And if any of you have followed me, I've done uh, panels on wearing masks. 
And this concept is really for all human beings. We all know that we show, we put our best foot forward and we show our best face when we're dealing with, with people. And so this mask concept is about what we show up with. So I'm gonna teach you in this section how being empathetic to others also helps you understand yourself as well and vice versa. So if we look here, usually when we encounter someone, like you see me today, and you see my behavior as I'm speaking to you, I have expressions or whatever, I'm moving my hands. I have you know, a certain kind of body language and you also are seeing each other throughout the conference. So this is kind of the outside mask that we all wear and that we see. But what is really going on, which we don't know, it's not always going on, but what we don't know is what is really going on behind that mask is history, sometimes pain, sometimes trauma, loss, regret, fear. Like, for example, most people know my story that in COVID, I lost my dad. I lost my baby sister. They both lived in New York. I'm from New York. I lost a fiance. I lost a high school best friend and other people. And so during COVID, I showed up like this where I'm doing my thing, but underneath, I was really suffering. And so it's important for you to get that concept because sometimes when people behave a certain way, give them a little bit of compassion because you don't really know what's going on behind the mask. And the same is for you. You also may be going through things that you are hiding behind the mask. And so empathy becomes really important because it says that, you know, we're able to relate to the fact that people have experiences that we might not know about that they may not want to share. That also we can build trust just by saying, you know, someone snaps snaps at you or whatever you don't understand to go, you know what, let me let me come back. Let me get back to you. That's empathy. That's saying, you know what, I'm not going to fight you back. I'm just going to assume that something's going on that I can't see and you need support. And also creating empathy can provide dignity to an individual who's struggling. And I always tell this story. I live in L.A. and I remember when I originally when I first moved here, we were sitting in a restaurant in Beverly Hills. So it's Beverly Hills, right, where, you know, the rich and famous are. And a homeless, there's a lot of homeless. A homeless man walks by, we're outside, walks by the table. And the person I'm with sort of takes their half-eaten sandwich and hands it to the homeless man. And the homeless man smacks uh, his hand and just and refused the food. And the person was really shocked. What I explained is that this concept of dignity means that, again, I may be homeless, but you don't know my history, what I've been through. And just like you, I don't want to eat food that a stranger has given me. I want to be able to, in the little bit of control that I have as a homeless pe person, to decide that for myself. So it's just important to provide dignity as a way of being empathetic to people. And so now what I want to share with you is how can you start to understand some of these things that are going on? Because this is going to help you manage your stress as well. And we will get into some specific exercises about how to manage your stress. So when we look um, here, the common behaviors and fears that are hidden behind the mask are these four. Most people in general at work, they become either overwhelmed, dis they feel disrespected in what they're doing ignored or rejected. And I'm sure that if I were to ask for a raise of hand, most people in the audience would agree that they've all been down this path and it doesn't feel good when any of these things are happening to you, whether it's at work or at home. And so here's a cheat sheet of really to, for you to understand if this is happening to you and also so for you to understand if it's happening to someone else. So for example, when you are overwhelmed, your the intensity of your feelings outmatch your ability to manage them. So in other words, I have all of these things to do and I feel like I want to crawl under the covers is what overwhelmment feels like. And here are some emotions that show up when a person is overwhelmed. So these are things that can help you identify whether you're overwhelmed or not, but also how you can identify whether or not your teammate or your partner or someone that you're working with is also going through this. 
So being overwhelmed, you will, it, it overwhelm, it usually impacts the body a lot and it, it causes anxiety, which we'll talk about a little bit later. The next one is disrespected. And that one is around the idea that another person's feelings have been impolitely disregarded. So again, <laughs> Your feelings are disregarded, or if you are disregarding someone else's feelings. Oftentimes, when you're disrespected, what happens? You disrespect the person back, right? Because it's like, oh, no, you are not going to speak to me this way. And so acting rude and polite, over-talking, all of these things are symptoms of, of someone either feeling disrespected or showing, disbeha showing behaviors that are disrespectful. Or disrespectful. And the other two are being ignored and rejected. So again, when you're being ignored, believe it or not, and this was always fascinating to me, when I think about being ignored, I think about it being very cold. Like I am not talking to you. I'm not responding to you. I'm, I'm, you don't exist to me. But also being ignored from a psychological standpoint can have a, heart, a hot form also which is when you have heated arguments, you're actually ignoring the person's issue. So you would rather argue about the issue or argue about something else so that in a way of showing um, uh, that you don't care about the topic. So again, if you are ignored or being ignored, here are what some of the behaviors look like. And usually it, being ignored, you know, it makes you feel self-doubt. It makes you feel like you're not worthy and so on. So these are the things, again, that you can start to identify. Because remember, this computer system we have that's called our mind operating system, these are, pro these are programs. These are routines that are built into our minds. And now what we're doing right now is uncovering that this is what our bodies are told to do from our brain when we feel this way. And finally, being rejected. So being rejected is probably one of the most serious implications um, in, in our psyche. Most people who are rejected are ostracized people, and they can become very aggressive and can turn violent. So it's really important. You know, a lot of times in, in organizations, there are people who we ignore or we put in a corner because somehow they're different or they don't think the way that we are. I would really caution and encourage everyone to not reject individuals because this is a person who will be able to sit and ruminate and get frustrated and can really become passive aggressive. Oftentimes this looks like hurt feeling. You can see that sense of loneliness, jealousy that they're not included, guilt, shame, social anxiety, embarrassment, et cetera. So I think that you could likely identify yourself in any of these feelings. And also you could likely identify that it maps back to some of these behaviors. And so this is how, from a, a team perspective, that you can support people. And when we talk about psychological safety, and human behavior around whether you feel overwhelmed, rejected, ignored, um, et cetera. You can, so these are just tips, and these are in the workbook, the handout that's attached. But you can ask things of others when you observe those behavior is, how can I best help you? Hey, it looks like, you know, and you don't say this verbatim, but you sort of introduce it and say, hey, um, it looks like you're struggling today, or it looks like, you know, I've had a rough morning. It looks like you have to... Can I help you? Or, you know, what do you think about what's going on? Or is there something that I've done? So in other words, you can leverage some of these questions, but you have to have context around what's going on. You can also show engagement, again, by asking, are you okay? Uh, tell me more about what's happening, et cetera. You can also demonstrate understanding and empathy, which is what we've been talking about. You can also sort of say, and I don't know how many of you know what your unique skills are, but when we do branding work, we talk about what is your unique gift that you bring to And so if you know that, like if you're a person who happens to be funny or you're, you, you have, you, you know, you're warm or you're good at listening, you can just offer to say, hey, I'm just listening. Do you want to talk it out? 
So again, whatever it is that you know that you can offer that's something that either will support them or it's something that you're really good at, it's important in these moments in psychological safety to do those things. And then finally, even especially for yourself, encourage positivity. You know, again, you can do this. We got this. We got this together. But, you know, the whole team is here to support you. And most of us think that people don't want this kind of support. But I will tell you in today's world of stress and change and meanness and madness, people actually do want this support. So I encourage you, if you haven't tried this, to try it. It might feel awkward. And let me just mention another thing. With the mind, anything that you do that is not your normal routine will feel awkward. It's like when you develop a new code and you got to put it into testing. It's not going to act right until you test it, when you debug it, and you update it. You have to go through a process to get that code. This is the same thing with introducing something new to, into the brain. It's going to feel awkward. It might be awkward. But the more you run the routine over, it becomes your brain will learn, and then it will become automatic. Okay, and so that was about the team and also about some, you know, traditional foundational things that humans struggle with around and how psychological safety can help. But now I want to talk about self-support for the individual. How can you um, deal with your stress and resilience? Okay, so when we talk about it, uh, stress and emotional resilience. There is a cycle. And again, as I mentioned, much of the brain is just like a computer program. It is once you get um, once you get the routines in, once you get the processes going, they run automatically. And that's how this resilience cycle will work once you get into it. So the first thing that happens is you have a traumatic event, whatever it is. Unemployment, poverty, an illness, something happens in your family. Then the next thing that happens is your brain, because of the way you've trained it, says, oh, oh my God, this is like something really bad. And you're going to have an emotional reaction. Usually it's going to be fight or flight. Now that process is normal until you do it for everything. So once you have this, and you notice the word proceed. Because if you practice some of the tools I'm going to give you, then your perception of the issue is, yes, this is bad, but back to around to the next uh, bullet here, I have the coping mechanism, the communication, the guidance, the emotional support, and the tools in order to support myself when this traumatic event happens. So it's important to have stress management tools so that you'll be able to overcome these things. Because guess what? We want to get to emotional resilience, where you have internal strength, where you're able to be flexible and to adjust to things that are happening that you don't have any control over. Because guess what? Like any good old routine or program, it starts over. Sometimes we get two or three traumatic events at one time, and this cycle is going on over and over and over in our mind. But if we can get to the point that we have the coping mechanism, then we can have a more well-balanced and emotional resilient way to stay balanced even in the face of tremendous stress. So this is basically what is happening in your, in your mind. And it's driving information into your body. So what is resiliency? Resilience is a muscle. It's just like our brain. Our brain, in addition to being an operating system, is also an organ. It's a muscle. And we don't use that muscle enough. And that's why it feels awkward when we're talking about some of these brain and mind things. So when we talk about resilience, we have to flex it enough back to practicing, back to getting routines going automatically. You want to flex it enough so it'll take less effort to get over trauma and stress whenever it happens. So this is a way that we grow to avoid actions that might lead us into continuous stress. 
Now, I almost didn't include the slide, but and I was going to make it less, but I think in this case, more is more. This is what is going on with stress in your mind and body. And so I do want to call out a couple of important pieces here. And this is where the cycle gets really dangerous for us in today's world. So the ideal state is this resting or working nervous system, right? Where we're calm. We, our muscles feel relaxed, our mind is focused and clear, our blood pressure is normal, we're breathing well. This is good, but oftentimes we don't stay in this state. So what starts to happen is, as we mentioned in the previous slide, we have a perceived negative. And when this happens, all of a sudden now, we have either a physical threat or something perceived and we go up into this space here, which is the danger zone. And this red space, which is the fight or flight, this is how the body works and it's normal until we have so many different things coming up all the time that we start to stay in the zone where our muscles are tense, our mind is thinking about a hundred things, we're, and we're releasing stress hormones, which actually shut down our immune system. Our heart rate gets higher, our breathing gets shallow and quick, we can't digest food and on and on. Unfortunately, this danger zone, when it's repeated over and over, starts to indicate stress and anxiety. And 41% of adults have chronic stress, 41% of adults in America. And if you look at this table here, it, it, if you look at fatigue, poor concentration, poor memory, decrease in performance, and on and on. We end up with so many illnesses like diabetes, heart disease, um, all kinds of things that land us in the hospital and also can impact our ability to work. And so this is the situation that we go back and forth. Unfortunately, we don't stay in this in the state over here into the green and orange, which we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, we, we don't stay in the blue with our ideal state. We kind of go quickly and stay in this danger zone. So what really is important is that only human beings, we're the only species that carries stress around in our minds. Worries, fears, expectations, regrets, and self-criticism. Uh, is what we have to learn how to reprogram our brains so that we get rid of those things or else we stay in this danger zone and we start to increase the chronic stress and the diseases that it causes. And so again, back to this slide, when we have a traumatic event, in this one, all that one page I showed you, is what is going on when we have a perceived stress event. So the idea in resiliency is to get to coping mechanisms so that we don't come back to this chaos. So we want to get mechanisms that will keep us out of the danger zone. So what exactly is anxiety and stress? So anxiety is rooted in the fear of the unknown. And I actually spend a lot of time working with people and organizations in the unknown. The unknown is actually a wonderful place because it's a place of possibilities. It's a place of what ifs, and it's actually a very creative place. But as human beings, because we're programmed to, I want to know what is getting ready to happen. Tell me what's in this for me. Tell me what's going to happen to me. Because we want to know, we're afraid of the unknown for the most part. And that fear causes us anxiety. And it's very crippling. And it, it us from moving forward and experiencing life. So again, as I mentioned, the 41% of, of people who are impacted by chronic stress and anxiety left unchecked, it can harm the body physically and emotionally. In addition, it also impacts our performance. So if you didn't think the psychological safety and understanding the stress matters, it impacts your decision-making. It adds pressure to time constraints because when you're not focused, you can't really think and you're not as efficient. It limits your creativity. 
It also makes it difficult for you to process information. You ever notice when you're stressed out, you just can't seem to remember what's going on or just your, your brain's cloudy and you know it. And finally, you default to thinking in extremes. So I also realize when I'm stressed out, whether it's because I'm tired or I'm overwhelmed, I, I will tend to do extremes like, um, oh my God, um, the carpet, I spilled something on the carpet. You know what? Now I'm going to have to replace the carpet. And that's extreme. All you got to do is clean up that one section. But if you become irrational when you are also um, under stress and anxiety. I don't know if anybody can relate to that, but um, that's an important thing to get. So what we want to do in order to help with this and keep us resilient so that we, when we have problems come up, we have processes to manage them, we understand what's going on in our body, or we understand what has happened a little bit to someone on our team, we have the empathy because we have psychological safety to say, can I help you? Let me help you. We want to do a brain check. And I, I I like this slide because the brain, again, is it's not only our operating system, but it's a muscle. And it needs to be worked out as well as all the other organs in our body. So I'm going to share some things with you. And because I'm not physically there, I, I won't be able to necessarily demonstrate but I will walk you through some of the techniques that you can use in order to be able to start to shift your brain so that you will be more, learn how to be more relaxed when things occur. Okay, so here are some relief valves that make you more resilient. So one of the things as a stress buster, here are just a couple of tips. You can plan breaks rest and fun now again some of these things you might be like oh my god we've heard of this stuff but have you done it just taking a break like some people will say well i'm taking a break and what that means is i'm going to read about this you know this process while i'm i'm sitting down on the beach that's not a break the break is for your brain if you're still working but your body's resting that's not what we're talking about here. We're saying that your mind and your body are both resting. They're not doing anything, but having fun or resting. You also want to develop realism. You know, there are three things that we believe in psychology that makes one happy. And one of them is having realistic expectations. You know how we are. We will plan all of this. We really have time for this. So being realistic can also reduce stress. You know what? I really want to get this code done or documentation or the user manual, whatever it is you have to create. I want to get that done by next week. And in your mind, your mind is saying, no, you can't. But you still commit to it. And so listen to yourself and develop realistic expectations, and that will help reduce stress. Also, prioritize your work and also ask for help. If every one of you who can hear me starts psychological safety, i.e., I'm supporting my environment, I'm helping others, then you have the space to ask for help because as a team, you all are there to support each other. Also, eating well. Again, the body is the fuel, and that the, you know when we eat, it gives the body fuel. It also gives the brain fuel. So again, it's important to eat well. We all hear about exercising. Although, you know, studies are really changing the advice on how to exercise. So read up on some of the new things and see if any of those will work for you. Like now, there's lazy exercising, which I really love. There, there's like there's this thing where you can lie in bed and they show you how to do the leg lifts and the arm lifts and how to run in place in bed. I mean, that sounds like amazing. To me. There's also like wall Pilates now where you can just lay on the wall. And actually, science says that these things really help. It doesn't have to be this full out. Let me put on gear. Let me run up the mountain and down the slope. And we don't have to do all that. So figure out, do some investigation about what kind of exercise can work. And finally, on the exercise, even now, the sprints, like three three to five minutes of exercise, 
throughout the day also can be really important. For those of you who work at home, for example, in my space, I have exercise balls, medicine balls, weights, and all of those things integrated into my workspace so that when I'm taking a moment, I can just pick up a weight or get on the exercise ball or something. So integrate exercise into your your room. And then finally, learning a mindful technique, whether it's meditation, yoga, tai chi, qigong, just try some things because training your brain to be calm is one of the most important things that we can do. It will help everything in your body be calm. And also it'll create a life that is calm because when you are calm, the way you approach people is calm. Usually the outcomes that you get are calm. And so you really, this mindful technique piece is very important. So let's look at a couple of techniques. So when we look at relaxation techniques, and I love this one because I always ask people, how many people in the audience are holding their breath? Right now, you're likely holding your breath. So what I want you to do is I want you to just, in your chair, just sit comfortably. And I really appreciate those who will do these exercises with me. So now I want you, as you notice your body, just turn your awareness and notice your breath. Are you breathing? And let's go ahead and take a deep breath. If you just hold, you know, just take a deep breath and release it like a really good deep breath. And I bet that you will notice that immediately you feel a bit more relaxed. When you're relaxed, you're able to notice more things. You're able to do more things. So just simply breathing is important. It shifts you from an automatic response. So in other words, if I'm not breathing and you walk up to me, likely I will probably be startled and probably I'm going to look at you and go, what are you doing? Versus if I am, if I have breath in my body, I notice that you're coming. You're not going to startle me. And I'm going to say, hey, how are you? I'm happy to see you. And so that's an example of how a small thing, like making sure that you have breath in your body will help you be more calm. And also if you're in in a stressful situation, remember to breathe because that also can bring down the stress and it tells, it signals your body to calm down. Now the the next technique that I wanna look at is around something called cross crawls. Now this is about, and most of the work I want to tell you is that will help you reduce stress is mind-body. Whenever you can do something where you can engage your body and also your brain, that's when you're going to get the most results in the quickest way. And so part of what we do, a lot of the work that I do is around integrating the creative mind, which is in the right side of our brain, to our logical mind, which is the mind that we use to do coding, to do of uh, business, data analysis, and those kind of things. And we only use, we use 20% or less of the right side of our brain. So when we engage both sides of our brain, it helps us think better. It builds our immune, immune system up. It gives us more creativity. And again, you can see things more, more clearly. And so here, um, what you want to do is you're just basically alternately touching your right hand, if you're standing to your elbow. And you can also do this, um, you know, sitting down. So you touch your right hand and elbow to your left knee. So like, and some of you have probably done these exercises before. You're basically just doing, you know, touching elbow to the opposite um, arm. And you do this for 25 times or two minutes. And again, this, these are good exercises because, you know, we all work, we work from home and we generally sometimes work around the clock. These are things that you can do in short increments that will reduce your stress. So I usually do this when I am shifting between doing like boring administrative work to wanting to now start to sit down and to design something, design an experience. I'll usually make sure that I, it it sort of signals my brain that I'm going to do something different. 
And then by, again, engaging my mind and my body while I'm doing this, what I'm thinking about is just allowing my mind to wander about the next thing that I'm going to be working on. So, and it's amazing because the brain, by the way, has this executive function that's in the back of the brain that is always on. And so when you're trying to work through a problem, you know how you can't find a solution, but you get in the shower or you take a walk and, or you go to sleep and voila, the answer comes. It's because the brain, again, is in, it's, it has a background system that's always working. It's like when we're looking at security, the security code is always checking to make sure that applications are safe. Similar thing that it's checking to make sure that the things that you haven't figured out, that it's working on them. So this exercise will help you also uh, problem solve. Some of the things you're trying to work out, may, solutions may show up when you're doing the cross crawls. And then the lazy eights. Now this is one of my favorite ones. And again, there's so many ways to uh, be resilient, but what I'm sharing with you are more sort of office related things that you can do that are things that you can leave today and begin doing. And so again, if you follow these directions, you're making a fist with your dominant hand and you're positioning your thumb up. And then you're gonna hold your arm straight out in front of you, bending your elbow slightly. And the idea is that when you lift your thumb up slightly, you're gonna begin making horizontal figure eights. And if you notice, if you can see me, I'm my eyes are following the horizontal figure eight. And if you were to do this with me, you will notice that you get a little bit, if, but do it slowly because you can get dizzy. When you do it slowly, again, it's making you focused. It's making your mind focused. If you do this for about a minute or two, let's say you're outside in a meeting, you're going into a meeting, you know it's going to be stressful. You do this, it focuses your brain. So again, you're out of the, I'm not going to rush and be stressed. I'm just going to relax and focus. Again, you're breathing while you're doing all these exercises, you're making sure that you're breathing. Now this, and then you can do it if you know you want, you can do it with your non-dominant hand and then do it again. And also this one I like because you can doodle. If you're a doodler, you can doodle on your paper. When you're in a meeting, let's say you're getting stressed out about something or you're disagreeing with the speaker and hopefully no one's disagreeing with me, but you're disagreeing with the speaker and then you are just, you know, whatever it is, silently, you're writing on the paper, you're doodling. And if you do this slowly and let your eyes follow it, you will notice that you will begin to get relaxed. And if you're upset, your temperature will start going down, down, down. And you'll start to feel like, okay, now I can handle whatever this situation is. Okay? And so this particular one, Looks like a lot, but it actually really isn't. This one I absolutely love. It's like my, I guess it's my first favorite. The one before is my second favorite, or maybe they're a tie. But why I like this is because if you do this exercise, it will feel like you just left the gym. And it usually takes one to two minutes. Again, a lot of these exercises, once you do them enough, remember, we're just like a computer. Once you program this into your brain, and you do the routine enough, it becomes a pattern. And then it will automatically start operating without you having to intervene. So the idea is that you're tensing muscles. So you're gonna sit, let's say in a, in a space, close your eyes and you focus on your breathing, right? And again, the breath becomes really, if you don't remember anything from this presentation, can you please just remember to breathe? If you can breathe, that'll start to unlock and release so many things in your body that you're walking around carrying. Because when we don't breathe, we're, st we're stiff. Our shoulders are up, our neck is sore, you know, and so on. So that's why we want to get comfortable and breathe. Then I want you all to try this in the audience. Use your hand to make a tight fist. So you're making a tight fist. And then hold, you squeeze this fist for a few seconds for like as, as hard as you can. And notice all the tension in your hand. Just notice it. 
And then if you slowly start to open your hand, so visualize that you're opening every muscle in your hand, one muscle at a time. So you're doing it slowly. And you will start to notice the tension leaving your hand. And eventually your hand will feel lighter and more relaxed. And so if you were to do this for every muscle in your body, like you can now start with your shoulders, you can tense up your shoulders and hold it for you know a few seconds as much as you can, and then slowly releasing your shoulders, you start to feel like, oh, okay, wait a minute, my shoulders now feel more relaxed. And so you actually can do this for your entire body. As long as it's not an area, like if you have an in injury, let's say, then we don't want you to do to uh, tense up the muscles in the injury area. But these, these are very, this is, again, really short, very simple techniques. But if you do them, I promise you that they will start to relieve and reduce your stress. This is an entryway to get into stress reduction and resiliency. And once you, you realize that these things work, it will encourage you to explore other modalities like maybe meditation or other things. So what I'm sharing with you are tips that you can do now without leaving your office, without having to get up and do anything. So there's no excuse. You can try this now and then move on to the larger and bigger things. So this is removing anxiety. And again, I encourage you, I think um, you guys are going to lunch after this. I would encourage you when you get back from lunch, try this exercise because usually we're sluggish from lunch and we're not awake. This exercise makes you feel like you just worked out. So it will wake you up. And then, you know, the final thing, which is a whole like, you know, I can do a week or two or three or months course on shifting your thinking. Um, this is probably one of the most important things that we can do, because remember, the majority of our thoughts that we have, and we have a lot of thoughts every day, tend to be negative. And so it is important for you to begin to, as you take a breath, recognize, what am I saying to myself? Did I just say, you know what, I don't know why you're sitting in this conference, because you have all this work to do, you don't have time. That's negative. Um, I don't know why I'm sitting here listening about psychological safety, because it doesn't work. That's negative and so on. So this is why we have to shift our self-talk because when we shift our self-talk, it shifts our thinking and our thinking really equates to our behavior. So again, just like a computer routine runs, our behavior based on what we put in our minds, our behavior shows others what we're actually thinking, whether we believe it or not. And so in this way, we look at this concept called fixed mindset and growth mindset. And again, I'm just going to spend a moment on this, but um, it's sort of like, for example, it's embarrassing when I make a mistake. And most people are embarrassed when they make a mistake. But if you're in a psychological safe space, you know, hey, look, everybody makes mistakes and mistakes are opportunities to learn. So it's like, okay, yeah, I didn't do that so well, but what did I learn from it? Because when you can have a more positive outcome, then you're likely going to take that learning into something and you're going to keep growing. So you make less and less mistakes. Um, I don't do, or I don't try new or difficult things, then I won't fail. So for like example, why would I try these silly exercises? Because it's new and uh, it's not going to make sense or it's not going to work. But you know, the, the positive message in your mind should be, you know what, I, I have to try new things and or difficult things in order to grow. Even if it doesn't work the first time, let me keep trying because I want to find something new to do. Uh, when I fail, I get frustrated and give up. This is what most people do. Well, when I fail or get frustrated, I try again. So you can see the difference in the way that we're thinking or when we say, I can't do that. Um, you know, well, no, I can't do that yet, but I'm going to keep trying new strategies or asking for help until I understand how to do this. So you can see the importance of shifting your thinking and how that can make a significant difference. And so in closing, I just want to uh, offer that, you know, there is no separation of mind and emotions and even because they're linked 
together to your learning and to also the way that you show up. So I hope that in this short time that I've been able to give you some tips that you can use, that you can start, so you can start the journey of trying to manage your stress so that you can be uh, and contribute in the way that you need to in your organization and also in your life. And then finally, we have set up, and I just want to say how impressed I am that the Linux Foundation has set up an opportunity for you all to spend time with me at no cost to you. If you um, if you go to this calendar, you can book, I believe it's 20 minute sessions, and I can help you with the stress reduction, or you can ask me any question you want about the psyche or something that you're challenged with in the workplace, as long as it's something that we can deal with in a short amount of time. And so here's the information to do that. I wish you all uh, an amazing rest of the conference, and I wish you all the best in your future endeavors. And more than anything, I wish that you will become more resilient in ways that will reduce your stress and anxiety, and also that you create a psychologically safe environment in your workplace. Thank you so much.